The Leaders Summit on Climate was hosted by US President Joe Biden, uh, April 22 and 23 uh, earlier this year. The summit was intended to underscore the urgency and the economic benefits of stronger climate action and a key milestone on the road to the United Nations Climate Change Conference this November in Glasgow. More than 40 world leaders attended the virtual summit, including French President Emmanuel Macron, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, uh, Indian Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi, Chinese President Xi and Russian President Vladimir Putin. Our special guests are here to discuss the summit and the responses to the summit from some academics studying climate change. Dr. Patrick Moore has been a leader in the international environmental field for more than 45 years and a founding director of the CO2 Coalition. And his new book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom, is doing very well. Gregory Wrightstone is the executive director of the CO2 Coalition and a geologist and author of the best-selling book, Inconvenient Facts, the science that Al Gore doesn't want you to know. First of all, gentlemen, uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, nations from the recent Leaders Summit on Climate are mandated to offer plans aiming to prevent rising global temperatures from rising two degrees Celsius and ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Uh, Greg, is this a nonsense goal and where are we at with this at the moment? Yeah, actually, if we look, it's, uh, it, it is a nonsense goal. Uh, they're trying to control the uncontrollable, that is change the temperature of the earth. Uh, we are in a warming trend, there's no doubt about that, but we've been warming for more than 300 years. The first 250 years of that had to have been completely naturally driven, and we're being asked to believe that, oh, well, those natural forces driving temperatures for the first 250 years suddenly ceased in the middle of the 20th century. That's not how climate works. That's not how science works. Um, and, and what we see is there is no climate crisis. Uh, there is no climate emergency. By almost every metric, the modest warming of the last century combined with increasing CO2 is leading to an earth and its ecosystems that are thriving, prospering and greening and humanity is benefiting from it. Uh, it just is and it's very well documented. The science tells us that. Patrick, do you think this is a nonsense goal and uh, where do you think we're at with this also? Of course, it's a nonsense goal. The difference in temperature between Cairns and Sydney is a lot more than that. And the difference in temperature in any day of the year from night to daytime is a lot more than that. It's, it's a silly goal. And, and, and there's no way the temperature of the earth is going to heat up quickly over this short kind of time period they're talking about anyway. But even if it did, it wouldn't be a disaster. 20 times as many people die from cold as die from heat every year in this world. It's cold that we should fear, not warmth. And the other thing people don't seem to understand is this is one of the coldest periods in the history of life on Earth. It's the place to see ice age, for goodness sakes, and everybody thinks it's too hot. It's been hotter than this for almost the entire history of life. We are in an anomaly called an ice age, and it's, it's been going on for 2.5 million years. And thankfully, we're in an interglacial period now when it's a little bit warmer than it was during the depths of the glaciations. And this, this is why civilization has flourished over the last 10,000 years. But to say that another two degrees is going to cause a climate emergency, I don't hear any sirens and I don't hear anybody heading for shelters. It's, it's a complete fantasy, this idea that two degrees would be harmful. The U.S. envisions uh, curbing power sector emissions by 80% by 2035 and eliminating them entirely by 2050. Also, the U.S. would aim to reduce emissions of between 50 to 52% by 2030 on 2005 levels. Patrick, is this possible or even desirable? Well, I guess it's possible if you're crazy uh, or if you, you know, have a dictatorship, uh, but it seems to me that uh, the most democratic countries are the ones who are talking about this the most, and, and the countries with uh, stronger central governments 
are not bothering to do much about it at all. Like China, for example, they, they talk a good talk, but they're not actually doing anything. And they, you know, they say they'll do something by 2060, more or less. That's a ways out. Everybody in power now will be dead by then. So, of course, it's ridiculous to eliminate 80% of our whole civilization's energy in such a short period of time with nothing to replace it with, seeing as though the same people who want to do that are against both nuclear energy and hydroelectric energy, the two technologies that could actually provide a 24-7 uh, reasonably priced power to replace fossil fuels for many different uses. But by and large, it's a pipe dream and it's a recipe for, it's basically a suicide pact for civilization is what it is if they did it, which they won't do. It's all a bunch of virtually virtual signaling at the virtual conference. Gregory, what do you think? Uh, is it possible uh, or even desirable? I sort of know the answer, but we need to hear from you. Like Patrick says, I guess it's possible to reduce it, but the, the dirty little secret is John Kerry, our, our climate change czar or ambassador, whatever they, they call him, gave away the, the, he gave up the little secret last week in, a, in an interview with CNN. He stated that if China and the United States both reduced their emissions to zero, it would have zero effect on climate change. And then the very next day, he said even if the entire Earth went to zero CO2 emissions, that wouldn't be enough. And, and what we see is, too, I, I like to look back through human history and Earth's history. I'm a geologist. And we're being told, oh, my God, we can't let it get another degree and a half or two degrees warmer, or there's going to be famine and pestilence, and we're all going to die. Well, that's what happened in Earth's history and human history when that happened in the past. And we see human history and Earth's history tells us that each of these past warming periods that got much warmer than today, uh, great civilizations and empires rose up. People thrived. Food was bountiful. It was the intervening cold periods between each that were horrific. Each of the cooling periods led to crop failure, famine, pestilence, and mass depopulation. Each time, they, these, these cold periods went by the names of things like the Greek Dark Ages, the Dark Ages, and the most recent one was the Little Ice Age. In the Little Ice Age, just a few hundred years ago, it's thought that as much as a third, as a third of the population of the Earth perished. Um, no, these cold periods, again, were horrific. The big story, and again, it's the opposite of what we're being told. The story we should see here by looking at Earth and human history is welcome the warmth and fear the cold. That's what history tells us. Joe Biden emoted, the signs are unmistakable. The science is undeniable, but the cost of inaction keeps mounting man. That's what he always says, man, at the end of when he's saying something. Get with the plan, man. Which doomsday arguments, though, uh, used in the past have been comprehensively debunked and can no longer be used by politicians today, Greg? Yeah, well, actually, Patrick and I both, I, uh, there was this UN report on extinctions that, was, that were, was published in late 2019. They claimed that there would be one million extinctions over the next several decades. And my alarm bells went off, and I went back and looked at it, and they had a chart that showed skyrocketing extinctions. I went back and looked at the exact same data, and I looked at it on a decadal scale every 10 years uh, to find that actually extinctions have been in significant decline since the beginning of the 20th century, uh, completely refuting. Now, to get to get to 1 million extinctions, you'd have to have 25,000 to 30,000 extinctions per year. You know what it's been for the last 40 years? Two. Two extinctions per year, not 2,000, not 202. Um, I published that, and then Dr. Moore actually testified before, I believe, the U.S. Senate uh, about this extinctions, and I believe he used some of the data that I created. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll it over to Patrick for his comment on this. Also, the, the bears are doing pretty well right now, aren't they, the polar bears? That's quite a story. I mean, how many decades have they tried to convince us that the polar bear will be come extinct by now, I think it was, or even sooner, uh, because the polar ice is melting. When in fact, they never tell us about the treaty that was signed in 1973 by all the polar nations, ending the unrestricted hunting of polar bears. Wildlife biologists went to the governments and said, there's too many people coming up here and killing polar bears to get a rug for front of their fireplace, and we got to do something about it. So the governments did, and since then, 
when the population was estimated around 8,000. It has grown now to somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000. So there is no worry about the polar bear. But, but even though the people who've been studying them have had to admit, because we've exposed them for lying about this, have had to admit that the population has grown steadily since then, nearly 50 years ago till today, now they say, oh, but they'll go extinct by 2100. And the fact is, the, the loss of ice in the summer, the ice is still totally covering the whole Arctic Ocean in the winter, and that's when the bears go out on the ice to hunt for seals. But in the summer, the ice has receded somewhat. This may well be the reason why the polar bears have recovered so quickly, because the ocean has to be open to the sun to grow plankton in the summer, to feed the fish, to feed the seals, to feed the bears. That's how the food chain works. That's how an ecosystem works. And people who are saying that there has to be more ice for polar bears to be better off are wrong. There's, it's not a question of no ice or all ice. There is a happy medium which is best for the bears. But these are the same people who, as Greg mentioned, are saying that a million species are going to go extinct in the next 20 or 30 years if we don't stop using fossil fuels. There are only 1.74 million species that have been identified in this world. So I, I'm going, are you guys saying that more than half of all the species in the world are going to go extinct if the temperature goes up by two degrees? No, they say, actually, the best estimate we have is there's 8.7 million species. Where did they find these other 6 million or so species? In a computer. They have no names. There's no photograph of them, no description, you know, no Latin name. Like you're supposed to have a Latin name if you're a species, like Homo sapiens, for example. And this is, this is how insane it's become. These are supposed to be United Nations scientists coming before the U.S. Congress to testify about the dire threat of extinction, and they make up that there are, like if two million species went extinct tonight, we wouldn't know what had happened because we didn't know they were here in the first place, according to these people. They just make up stuff. Um, it, it, it boggles the mind that at that level of the you know, world's largest economy with the most democratic government and these UN officials coming in and telling them that a million species are going to go extinct in 20 years if they don't end fossil fuels, somebody should get a brain here because there are not 8.7 million species. You mentioned um, uh, a computer, so I obviously think about modeling and uh, of late, the modeling has been fairly way off, uh, off the uh, point of reality uh, with climate and also with COVID, they almost got it completely wrong. Uh, so maybe because you guys are, are very good authors, the next book could be modeling for dummies. I'm not too sure about that part. Look, Professor, now we had a, a, some, some of the Australian academics have thrown their two bobs worth in, as we would say here, uh, following the, the summit of the mines, the great mines, they all met via Zoom. Some of it worked, some didn't. Professor Greta Peckle, I think it's Peckle, P-E-C-L, from the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies says, Australia has the third largest marine jurisdiction in the world, and within that, some of the fastest warming coastal regions in the world. Australia's southwest coast is warming at around three times the global average, and Australia's southeast coast almost four times the global average. So you could probably throw some tea leaves in there and have a cup of tea with a bit of salt. Now, these statements imply very bad things will result from warming ocean temperatures. Greg, is this so? Not at all. In fact, you can go just a little bit north of that area and find much warmer ocean uh, temperatures and the reefs and the life thrive there. Some of the most abundant sea life on Earth occur in much warmer temperatures uh, than what they're, they're complaining about. Um, so no, this is false. What do you think, Patrick? You know, for about 250 million years between the previous ice age, which was called the Karoo, which lasted 100 million years, and this one, the Pleistocene, which is only <clears> 2.5 <throat> million years old, 
there was 250 million years when the earth was warmer than it is now coming out of that Karoo ice age. The reefs were much more widely distributed then and more biodiverse with more species. And as the world cooled at, over the last 50 million years, it's, it's cooled. We're at the tail end of that cooling period in what is now the Pleistocene Ice Age. As the world cooled and the oceans cooled with it, the corals shrunk. And now the real sanctuary for the vast majority of coral species, over 60%, of the coral species are in the Indonesian archipelago. And if you look at Indonesia, Raja Ampat is the place to go and snorkel and, and, and scuba dive if you're wanting to see some of the most beautiful things that exist on the face of this earth. That ocean is not affected by cold water from the north or the south because Australia is to the south blocking cold water and Asia is to the north. And this is the most biodiverse coral in the world, and it is also the warmest ocean in the world. So the whole thing about the Great Barrier Reef getting too warm, it's not as warm as the Coral Triangle in Indonesia, and it has way less species in it because it's not as warm. That is a fact. It's in my book. It's in lots of scientific papers have recognized this fact that you know, there's no coral reefs in England or in Alaska. Like coral is one of the most tightly distributed in warm oceans of any group of species. Fish are much more widely distributed, but even fish are more biodiverse in the coral triangle than anywhere else on the planet. And so are almost every other class of marine life. There's a wonderful paper on this that was published nearly, well, 10 years ago now, I think, that shows that virtually all marine species are more abundant in warmer oceans. Well, that's good for us because we have more food. Um, Professor Samantha, now we're on with the academics here. Uh, Professor Samantha Hepburn, Research Director of the Law School at Deakin U University in Melbourne and Director of the Centre for Energy and Natural Resource Law, so you should be already wary of this, uh, says that gas is a fossil fuel She's right there and has no place in the future energy framework if we are to rapidly decelerate greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Patrick, how valid are such arguments when gas is so vital to many economies and lower CO2 emissions? Well, I'm not too worried about the lower CO2 emissions part. That's the other thing is, is not only is it colder now than it has been for most of the history of life, Carbon dioxide is lower even after we've added a bunch back into the air in this last hundred years or so. It's lower now than it has been throughout almost the whole history of the earth. The reason it's become lower is that plants have sucked it out of the atmosphere and animals too with making their calcareous shells. Those shells are made of calcium carbonate, the shells of corals, the shells of clams and crabs and shrimp and oysters and all the shelled creatures in the sea are sucking CO2 out of the ocean and it ends up on the bottom as rocks. And the CO2 that the plants sucked out on the, on the land, the forests, turned into coal. The plants in the sea, the plankton, fell to the bottom and other life too and turned into oil and gas. All of the CO2 that they used during their life that ended up being locked in the sediments as either carbonaceous rocks like limestone or as oil and gas and coal where all that CO2 used to be in the atmosphere. That's where they got it from and, and in the ocean. That's where the, the, the CO2 for life is in the air and in the oceans. And, and nothing would live in the air or the oceans if there wasn't CO2 there because it is the source of carbon for all life. So the fact of the matter is, we are simply restoring CO2 back to the atmosphere that was there already at one time. Not enough people realize that fossil fuels were made by life. They weren't made by, by Martians and brought here as some kind of poison to ruin the earth. They were made by living creatures. They were made with photosynthesis from the sun. Fossil fuels are the result of solar energy. And when we burn them, 
As long as we do good pollution control to get the minor pollutants like sulfur, etc., out of the smokestack, when we burn them, what we get is water and carbon dioxide, the two things the plants used to make themselves in the first place, and they ended up getting buried. Or the animals that make shells ended up, that ended up getting buried. By far the most carbon is actually in the limestone rocks, the, 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 the calcium carbonate rocks that, the, that creatures made shells with. But a good proportion of it is also in fossil fuels, and most of our emissions are from fossil fuels, about 95%. But 5% of our carbon dioxide emissions are from cement production, which is using those shells from those old creatures in the form of limestone to produce calcium oxide, lime, and put CO2 in the atmosphere, which was there in the first place. Greg, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. Natural gas is a is a wonderful fuel, very clean burning. It's CH4 is the molecule. And again, as Patrick said, when you burn methane, you get, you generate heat and you get water vapor and you get carbon dioxide. And Patrick and I are okay with a big carbon footprint because we love CO2. If you look on the back of my SUV, I've got a big bumper sticker that says, I heart CO2. Uh, so we're big, very big proponents of the benefits. And we have nearly unlimited resources of natural gas. Right where I'm calling you from today, I'm right on top of the largest natural gas field in the world. It's called the Marcellus Shale. There are two others right below me. Uh, I, I wrote a report on this years ago. Uh, we looked, the next 14 largest gas fields in the, United, in the world combined equaled what I'm sitting on top of. That's how big it is. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful resource and it's the reason uh, horizontal drilling combined with fracking uh, is the reason that the United States is leading the world in CO2 emission reductions. And I don't think that should be the goal of doing this. Uh, but again, car methane from fracking uh, is a very clean resource compared to coal. Coal is, there are a lot of uh, pollutants with coal you need to scrub out of that. You don't need to do that with, with uh, natural gas. Well, that's in jeopardy, though, isn't it, with the Biden administration? Anything that uh, was in the past administration uh, in regards to fracking and, and so forth, it's regarded as being evil. I mean, almost the devil incarnate. Yeah, it is. Uh, in fact, it hurt, it, we just experienced this uh, myself, my own family. My son-in-law was employed in the working on a frack crew, uh, paid very, very good money. Uh, hard work, though. He, he worked for two weeks on and one week off, 12-hour shifts. It's not easy work, but again, it pays very well. Uh, but he saw the writing on the wall. Uh, he got out. He took a lower paying job, uh, but he saw the writing on the wall. He says, it's time, it's time to get out. This, uh, our, our jobs and livelihood are in threat. I'm not waiting around uh, for the ax to drop on me. Uh, so he, he started a new job this, just this week, yesterday, as a matter of fact. And, and he's happy mm. with it. Uh, we talk a lot about these solar and wind jobs. The dirty little secret is, they can't find enough people to do these jobs to install the, the panels and these uh, wind turbines because they don't pay well. Uh, it would pay probably a third or less of what my son-in-law was making to, to do this installation. Uh, people can make more mm. working at Starbucks and they don't have to get home with, go home with grease under their fingernails or have to climb 300 foot towers to, to install things. Uh, I think I would rather work at Starbucks than do that. Well, maybe you could help with a coffee. It's pretty horrible. Uh, uh, Professor uh, John Church from the Climate Change Research Centre, University of New South Wales, mm -hmm. he says to avoid crossing thresholds, much more aggressive cuts in greenhouse gas emissions than Australia is currently committed to are urgently required. The current Australian government's resistance is putting millions in the world and the natural environment at risk. Patrick, who and what is at risk from climate change? There is no risk from the climate change that would be caused by our CO2 emissions. It, it won't cause that much climate change. The main thing that CO2 is causing is increased growth of all the forests, all the food crops, and all the wildlands in the world. It was your CSIRO, your top science body, that first disclosed this in 19... Uh, sorry, in 2004, I think it was, when they published their study from satellites of monitoring the photosynthesis on the Earth. And they showed up to 30% increase in growth of plants over a 40-year period. 
And the NASA has found this even more recently. They found that an area the size of Germany and France combined in the Sahara Desert is greening because of the additional CO2 in the atmosphere. You see, carbon dioxide, after hundreds of millions of years of, of life depositing it on the bottom of the sea and in fossil fuel deposits where the carbon was lost from the global carbon cycle of life, it sunk to such low levels that if it had gone down much further in the last major glaciation 20,000 years ago, the plants would have started dying for lack of CO2. We have actually come along at a very appropriate moment in the history of this earth, a long history of life, three and a half billion years. We've come along at a very appropriate time to restore a balance to the carbon cycle. It happened inadvertently. We didn't start using fossil fuels so that the air would be able to fertilize the plants better. But that's what we have done in the process. It's exactly the opposite of what they are saying. And there are many, many scientists who agree with us on that, but they have been canceled from the mainstream media in the same way that Peter Ridd has been canceled in his comments, initially at least, on the Great Barrier Reef. I hear they're coming around now and recognizing that the Great Barrier Reef has covered recovered miraculously as if it was endangered in the first place. That was all a lie to begin with, but it made good media headlines and went all around the world. Most people think the Great Barrier Reef is already dead because they haven't heard the story about it has miraculously survived. But in the atmosphere, CO2 fertilization of the plants is the major reason why food crop production is increasing so rapidly all around the world. And ironically, almost, you'd think it's ironic, but it's not. It's logical. India and China, the two most populous countries, are contributing the most to the greening of the earth, first by putting more CO2 in the atmosphere to fertilize the plants, and secondly, by planting vast new areas of forest and highly intensive food production to feed their huge populations means that the biomass on those landscapes is absorbing that CO2 and growing as a result of it. It's completely opposite what they are saying. CO2 is at a historic low in this era of human life. I mean, people keep pretending the world started at 1850, what they call the pre-industrial era, before 1850. No, the world started a long time before that, and many of us have studied the ups and downs in temperature and CO2 through those millennia and we know that this is a phony campaign, the campaign to stop the world's climate from doing whatever they think we're doing to it. There is no truth to it. It is a big lie, and it is a big, bit, not conspiracy so much as conflict, con, conflict, not conflict, but convergence of interest among these key elites in the media, the activists, the politicians, and the scientists who are being paid by the politicians to give them these fear stories. And it's all about an invisible molecule named CO2 that nobody can see what it's doing. So they make up these scare stories. That's what my book is about. Fake invisible catastrophes and threats of doom is about the fact that all the scare stories are based on things that are either invisible or really remote like polar bears and coral reefs that the average citizen can't see it for themselves. So they are susceptible to these scarce stories. The censorship, Greg, is really interesting. Um, I'll just read from the, uh, one of the, uh, the newspapers, and by the way, it's all the same text. And it just says here, uh, Australia's iconic Great Barrier Reef is on the road to recovery after a relatively mild summer. And uh, then it says, no cyclones, um, the, uh, there's good rainfall on the catchment, flood levels in the waterways near the reef were generally not major or sustained, which is really interesting because there are a lot of cyclones. I went through two of those cyclones. Um, it's really interesting how the media, mainstream media, can really twist what is the truth. It is. And, and the, 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 again, what we're not being told is we need to put these, these, you might have a bad year of cyclones, but you need to put that bad year in the long-term perspective. And according to even the IPCC, they, have a, there's, they don't have any confidence at all that that hurricanes and tropical storms are increasing uh, due to due to warming. 
Uh, they're just not. And we see in the United States, we're the world's leader for tornadoes by far. Uh, some 90% of all tornadoes occur in the United States. Uh, we've been a significant decline in tornadoes. And why is that? Because rising temperatures, and again, we're, we're in a temperature rise right now. We have been for 300 years. Uh, rising temperatures don't cause extreme weather. It's the differentials between high and low that cause the extreme weather. And in fact, we, I have documentation. A lot of what we do is the United States. Uh, we looked at extreme weather-related deaths in the United States, and we found that it declined, those extreme weather-related deaths declined 99% over the last 100 years. Uh, the, and, and Patrick had just talked about this great story of an earth that's thriving, prospering, and greening. I call it the biggest untold story of the late 20th and early 20th century. Is this, is this just tremendous? Our crops are being turbocharged by the combination of modest warming. And just think about this. As you get warming temperatures, you have lengthened growing seasons. So killing frosts uh, end earlier in the spring and arrive late, later in the fall, so you get more plantings in. Uh, CO2 is turbocharging the growth. Uh, Dr. Craig Gidso, a member of the CO2 Coalition, I captured in my book, in Inconvenient Facts, uh, he did laboratory studies of what an increase of 300 parts per million uh, would do to 90 different crops, uh, representing 90% of, of the crops that we, we consume. And he found that there would be a 46% increase in crop growth, crop biomass, by an increase of 300 parts per million. That's a good story. That's a really, really good story. And we can look by almost every crop we're break re breaking records year after year after year. And a lot of that's due, again, to this modest rise in temperature and increase in CO2. Professor David uh, Booth of Marine Ecology at the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, which is otherwise known as UTS, and president of the Australian Coral Reef Society said, our oceans have helped buffer effects of CO2 somewhat until now, but are reaching breaking point. Apart from the huge loss of biodiversity, there will be reduced food security, especially for the millions relying on fish as their primary protein source. I have researched changes in reefs in eastern Australia firsthand for nearly three decades and have witnessed substantial change in kelp beds and shifting of fish species, which I've linked to climate change. So what's, what's your thoughts, uh, Greg? Well, it is true that we see, we're, again, once again, we state we're in a warming trend, and we do see that there are, with a warming trend, we do see some migration of, of where different fish, and for example, in the United States and along the East Coast, there's been a slight migration northward of lobster. Uh, but again, uh, it's a naturally occurring event. And as Patrick had mentioned before, Dr. Moore, uh, some of the highest uh, biodiversity areas of the oceans occur in much, much warmer areas than around Australia. Uh, some of the highest biodiversity areas and, and highest uh, uh, number of, of different corals and, and fish. Mm. What do you think, Patrick? I think they're lying. Uh, I, I honestly do. Well uh, there, there is, there is no evidence of 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 the reefs dying. A of course, cyclones, for example, are recognized as the main cause of damage of coral reefs in the tropical seas, because there are hurricanes there, and th that that's to be expected. Uh, although the, there are not hurricanes at the equator where it's calmer, the hurricanes are more like in the tr in the tropics like where Australia is. And the, the idea that the coral reefs are going to die is preposterous. They are not going to die because we're in a warming period, which is good for coral reefs. And they should recognize this. The hyperbole that's being used about it's, you know, it's almost too late, there's tipping points everywhere. It's nonsense. This, look behind me, that's Vancouver Island. You can't see the the ground for trees, it's so thick. And the same thing is true across the whole of Canada and the United States. You know, Europe in, in 1700, due to, they hadn't started using fossil fuels yet, so they were using wood for everything, to, to, to smelt iron and copper, to glass works, for heating every building, for all industry, for steam engines. They were running out of trees. And that's when forestry was invented. And therefore, they started planting trees. 
Europe was down to less than 10% forest cover in 1700, and today it has 42% forest cover because of people looking after the forest and learning how to manage the plants. And the same thing can be said with agriculture. I mean, where, where do these people in the cities who are in favor of this think all the stuff their city is made out of comes from? Where do they think the energy for their city comes from? Where do they think the food comes from? It comes in at night in large trucks powered by diesel engines, and they're sleeping on the 30th floor of some condominium in the middle of a huge urban center and go down in the morning and the shelves are stocked. What are we going to do, run these big trucks with batteries and all the farm equipment with batteries too? I don't think so. I don't think there's enough batteries in this world to run this world, and there never will be. We have a storage battery called fossil fuels. They were made with solar energy. Fossil fuels are the largest storage of energy on the, on the earth. They are a battery in themselves. And the whole idea that we're going to be able to survive on wind and solar, which goes away, well, solar just goes away half the time, and another third of the time, there's not much of it because the sun is so low on the horizon. Wind is completely unpredictable. And they think we're going to run the world on that. Well, I've got another story for them. They're whatever you do into the wind. That's what they're doing. I can I can visualize that, but hopefully I'm up, up well, I'm upwind it, from you at this stage. It's stuff, what you're so not. Quite good Thank you very much for that. <laughs> and they're doing. Hey, the director of the now here's another one. The director of the Centre for Sustainable Energy Systems at the Australian National University, Professor Andrew Blaker, says. Solar and wind can readily decarbonize electricity systems. Electri sorry, electrification, it's easy to say, of most land transport via electric vehicles and heating via electric heat pumps and electric furnaces is straightforward using existing widely deployed technology. This would eliminate 70% of emissions with an insignificant impact on electricity prices. Uh, Gregory, your thoughts? Well, that's just ridiculous. Uh, what we need for electricity generation, I use three words, three descriptors that we need. It's reliable, abundant, and affordable. Wind and solar doesn't meet any of The only one that doesn't meet any of those three descriptors, the only thing that meets that, reliable, abundant, and affordable, are the fossil fuels, uh, coal and natural gas. A nuclear is reliable and abundant, but it's certainly not affordable. A wind, again, wind and solar are not. Uh, these are these are what I call the unreliables, wind and solar. Uh, not only that, to get to what he's talking about, uh, you'd have to pave over a huge percentage of your of your country of, of Australia with solar panels and and wind turbines, uh, risking environmental uh, environmentally uh, risky animals and, and endangered animals. Uh, so what do we have to do? Destroy the earth in order to save it? Uh, and we've seen this we've seen this experiment go bad recently in Texas, uh, and Germany nearly had another Texas-type uh, loss of energy uh, in February uh, when their, both their wind and solar went down. The fact of the matter is you need, for every megawatt and kilowatt of solar and wind, you need to have exactly that much and back up reliable energy by fossil fuels or nuclear or hydroelectric. Patrick, what do you think? I mean, you're a great supporter of and I get in trouble for saying this word because I, I sound like George Bush. Uh, nuclear energy, what do you think? I think the reason nuclear energy is unaffordable in the United States and some other Western countries is because the regulations are so ridiculous. They've, they've basically regulated it out of affordability. Uh, if, you know, if, if China and India can afford to be building way more nuclear plants than any other countries in the world, uh, it's therefore must be affordable. I mean, they, they don't have the kind of money to throw around that the United States and the Western European economies do. And the, 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 if you look actually, though, you'll see that most of the countries in this world, there are 15 of them that get more than 30% of their electricity from nuclear energy. They are almost all in Europe. Uh, the, the United States is, has the most nuclear reactors, but because its economy is so huge, I think it's only about 50, 15% or 20% of the electricity in the U.S. 
then also the, 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 it's so irrational that the so-called greens, which is a word that is scientifically and technically undefinable, so therefore it's perfect for the woke society because they like words that no one can understand what they really mean. But the greens, as they call themselves, are totally against nuclear energy. Even though if you take France and Germany, France has about 70% nuclear and Germany has 15% nuclear. France has about exactly half the CO2 emissions per capita as Germany does, and their economies are not that much different. So it's very clear in actual reality, of real examples, that using nuclear energy greatly reduces the amount of fossil fuels that are used and CO2 emissions. I mean, I'm not in favor of fossil fuels because they have CO2 emissions, it's just that they are 80% of the world's energy. And if we want to replace them, we need something reliable to do it with. And that is nuclear energy. Hydroelectric is great, but it's only applicable where there's terrain and rainfall sufficient to produce it. It doesn't work very well in a flat country like Denmark or in a desert country like Saudi Arabia. But nuclear works everywhere. And there are 440 or so operating nuclear plants in the world today. Only one accident ever caused loss of life from nuclear. You can't say that about gas or coal or any of the other technologies. Actually, nuclear per kilowatt produced is safer than wind and solar. What do you see the greatest threat at the moment uh, you know, facing, I mean, just you and I or the average person down the street is it misinformation or is it the, uh, not the inactivity, but the activity of the activists who are part of this agenda, the, 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 the great global reset? I, I think it's the misinformation that's driving these extremely harmful and destructive economic policies. They're lying. What, what Dr. Moore said before, your, your viewers are being lied to about the consequences of our changing climate. They're being lied to about the effects of CO2. And we're being, these harmful policies are being imposed on us. Uh, and make no doubt, it will be extremely harmful. It'll be, it'll lead to much, much skyrocketing energy costs. Uh, they talk a lot about uh, climate justice and economic justice uh, impacting the poor, but the very, their very own policies will detrimentally impact the poor the most because the poor and those on fixed incomes pay the highest percentage of their incomes on energy. So if we, add, if we triple energy costs, which they could well do uh, over the next decade or more, uh, again, it hurts the poorest among us the most and those on fixed incomes. Patrick, you're getting your message out. You do hundreds and hundreds of uh, interviews. Um, but do you see the censorship from uh, mainstream media and social media, such as uh, Facebook, YouTube, um, you know, the others, Twitter and so forth, do you see that as being a great threat also? Because what they're doing is anybody with a differing view than the, 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 than the narrative, which, again, you shouldn't use the word narrative, as you've mentioned before, in a dis discussion about science. Do you see, though, that the threat of censorship and the misinformation as one of our great threats? Absolutely. Uh, I've been censored ever since I left Greenpeace over 30 years ago. But because I don't get into the partisan political aspect which interests me but I'm a scientist and I'm most interested in the science so I'm trying to stick to that and you know I've the things I've said today are the truth about the history of climate and and the fact that rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are entirely beneficial for both the environment and human civilization there is no doubt about that. If people need to study back in history, again, the world didn't start in 1850 when we started using fossil fuels. As a matter of fact, in 1850, everybody was still living with their animals in their house and, and, and living in poverty in so many cases. In 1850, 70 to 80% of the people were, were still growing the food because it took that many because there wasn't any mechanization. It's not that long ago when we came out of that terrible poverty and, and grinding work. I mean, go to Bangladesh and you'll see what it used to be like, because there 
still about 60% of the people are toiling on the land, working by hand to harvest their crops and plant their crops and having it can't put their kids more than up to eight years old in school before they need them for labor on the farm. And so this, this era that we live in now, we are so spoiled in, in so many ways that, that, that we should study what it used to be like 200 years ago. Just 200 years ago, never mind 2,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago when we were still emerging as a species on this earth. We came out of Africa only 150,000 years ago or so because we had fire, shelter and clothing and could live in the colder countries to the north and south of the equator. Even today we couldn't live without fire, shelter and clothing outside the tropical equatorial regions of the world. We are a tropical species. That's where we came from. And the only reason we can live in these colder climates is food, sorry, clothing, shelter, and, and fire. Those are the only reasons. Otherwise, we couldn't be here. So the world is not getting too hot. The world is in many ways too cold right now, and it's colder than it has been for most of the history of life on this planet. And that's just all there is to it. And CO2 is lower than it has been through most of the history of life on this planet. And people should just, just go to Wikipedia. This, this is actually all in Wikipedia and all over the internet. It's there for anybody to see, but people don't seem to bother doing that. They just listen to what's on the TV, which is, except exception of yourself and your colleagues, a lot of it Thank you very much. is not real and is not true. Dr. Patrick Moore, author of Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom, and Gregory Wrightstone, Executive Director of the CO2 Coalition and uh, author of the best-selling book, Inconvenient Facts, The Science That Al Gore Doesn't Want You to Know, which I absolutely love because it really irritates my family because they're all lefties. Thank you very much. Uh, just before we go, uh, Greg, what's the uh, website for the CO2 Coalition? Uh, CO2coalition.org. You can go to learn more about the many benefits of CO2. And we do take donations, by the way. Well, so do I, but I haven't got any donations yet. They're telling me to get a real job. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Pleasure.